it's finally time to talk about the cleric. This is a very popular class. People love playing it. I see at least one in every campaign that I run, every campaign that I watch or listen to. It's not a full party without a cleric of some sort, whether it's a multi-class cleric or a just standard mono cleric. Um, and I know that there's some rumblings going around people complaining that the cleric doesn't get their subclass at level 1 anymore. Um, I'm not quite sure how I feel about all the subclasses getting, or all the classes getting their subclass at the third level. It makes sense for it to be standardized across the classes, but for some classes it makes sense for them to have their subclass at level 1, and Cleric is one of those classes that should. Um, <laughs> but knowing uh, Dungeon Dragons development, development team, I'm sure they've done something to fill that void a little bit. So let's jump into it. Hello everyone, today we are talking about clerics. You know, those folks that keep you alive. Playing new things in all the classes and the subclasses, that is also true for clerics. One of the things that we wanted to make sure we did with the cleric, uh, which is also a very popular class, is as we've done with all of the classes, protect their core identity yeah. while looking for ways to amp up the fun, particularly for clerics and others who focus sometimes on healing, although of course many of us have played clerics who are all about smiting yeah. or, or something other than healing, but we wanted to make sure that anyone who was focusing on healing in the game really could feel good about it. And that's why we talked in our video about spells, about the buffs to many of the game's healing spells, and so clerics in particular are going to really feel that improvement and feel like that if they decide to spend their turn or part of their turn in battle uh, helping their friends or themselves get back into the fight, we're hoping they're going to feel far better about dedicating their playtime to that healing activity. Now, when it comes to the, the class itself, yeah. uh, right away at first level, people are going to get a brand new feature called Divine Order. Both the Druid and the Cleric now have a, this feature at first level that allows them to decide if they want to go more in the spellcasting direction or lean a little bit more into the armor and weapon direction. Now, Clerics and Druids both have at the baseline, sort of decent weapon and armor capability and are very solid spellcasters. So this choice is really a, a choice of emphasis or of, of spice. Whichever one you choose, you're still going to have, again, decent armor and weapons as well as very formidable spellcasting. If you decide to go in divine order with the new protector option, it means right at first level, you're going to start with proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor. This is how you can make the classic first edition cleric decked out in heavy armor and wielding a mace. But we've also acknowledged that over the decades, uh, many clerics have instead leaned more in a kind of robe wearing, divine magic wielding uh, aesthetic direction. And so the Thaumaturge option uh, supports that aesthetic by giving you an extra cantrip and also making it so that, and again, this is similar to what we did in the Druid, uh, buffing some of your ability checks with a bonus equal to your wisdom modifier. And in the case of the cleric, the ability checks that get buffed are your intelligence, arcana, and religion checks, uh, making it so that the thaumaturge... What? I'm sorry. <laughs> intelligence, arcana, and religion checks. Um... Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I am, but Arcana and Religion are already intelligence checks, and intelligence isn't a skill in, in and of itself. Um, we made an oopsie doodle three minutes in. <laughs> no, but for real though, this feature is, sounds really cool. Um, it It feels like 
picking a subclass that's not really a subclass, you know? Um, and by, by that, I mean you're picking a playstyle, which, you know, ordinarily your subclass is going to dictate your playstyle. But at level one with this feature, well, no matter which one you go with, it's going to dictate your playstyle overall. Um, so it's like, hey, we took away your, your subclass, but here's a little mini subclass. Subclass light. Uh, that you still get at first level because we don't know what else to do. I I like it. it. I think it's a good idea. I'm not trying to knock it. I just think it's funny that they pushed the subclass back and then essentially, like I said, gave a subclass light uh, for level one for for druids and in clerics. Um, it's it's just funny to me as all. Well. Uh, even if their intelligence isn't super high, can yeah. can tap into their divine magic to give them uh, a sense of information about yeah. either general magic in the form of arcana or about religion. Perfect. Now, in spellcasting, which is also at first level, there is an important change there where now clerics, every time they level up, can swap out one of their cantrips. Now you can say, oh, okay, I, I'm not using this cantrip as much as I thought, and so you can change. At second level, uh, clerics get their iconic channel divinity feature, just as before. Uh, it, it still includes the option to turn undead, which, uh, Again, goes all the way back to first edition of clerics channeling their divine might to drive back uh, the forces of undeath. They should leave those undead alone. <laughs> not fair. Uh, but we have also now added a brand new channel, channel divinity option for all clerics called Divine Spark. And this is a really fun channel divinity option where the cleric decides if they're going to channel this raw divine power either to harm someone or help them. So you can either deal damage with it or heal somebody with it. And we did this because looking over not only the subclasses for the cleric in this book, but as well as the other subclasses that have come out for the cleric over the years, clerics, depending on subclass choice, have had sort of varying use for their channel divinity. Like if if you uh, are in a campaign with few or no undead, turn undead does you no good. Yeah. And then some subclasses have channel divinity options that are useful every session. I'm sorry, I, I gotta ask. Are there actually DMs out there that aren't sprinkling undead in just for, for lore purposes, just for flavor? I mean, I personally have never run a campaign where I didn't have at least some undead. And it's not even just to, to make sure my cleric player feels useful outside of keeping the party alive. It's just, there's so many cases where undead fit in the, the area for the lore of the area. The, the setting is just perfect for undead. And I don't know why anybody would um, pass that up, I guess. I don't know. I've in, in all of the campaigns I've played, which remember it's been a while. Um, there have always been undead. I've never seen a, a campaign without undead. Um, so let me know it, in the comments below if if uh, you've played a, an entire campaign that didn't have undead. I don't mean just like a session. I mean like the entire campaign that didn't have undead. I'd be I'd be interested to hear hear some of those stories. You know. Session, and then other subclasses have channel divinity options that are uh, useful less frequently. With that reality in mind, we created Divine Spark to give every cleric, regardless of subclass, a channel divinity option that is likely to be useful in every single session of play. Because pretty much every session, at least one point, you're going to want to deal damage or heal somebody. Uh, unless you're having a very peaceful shopping montage uh, <laughs> session, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> um, That's fair. Uh, unless, you know, the, the cleric discovers that the shopkeep is undead and they need to drive them away yeah. <laughs> with Turn Undead. Now, that classic option, Turn Undead, it itself has been redesigned. As much as we enjoy the classic Turn Undead 
spirit of the undead who are affected scampering far away. Uh, we wanted this to be a bit less disruptive for the cleric because it is often not useful for the cleric, yeah. for the undead to now be half a mile away when it runs runs out. Right, and spread out, spread around the map. Yeah, exactly. So um, turn undead still, sh you know, if it affects an undead creature, it still shuts them down in terms of, you know, being able to do much of use for them, uh, but no longer has them uh, scrambling from you know here to the next town. Uh, and uh, we found that not only in the Unearthed Arcana process, but also in our own play tests, that this new version of Turn Undead is a lot of fun. And this is like a debuff or damage or? So what it does now uh, is the undead creature is uh, incapacitated and frightened oh, okay. for one minute. Um, and it does try to move as far as it can from you on its turns. Uh, but it's no longer dashing. Yeah, okay. Um, and it also is, it's clearer with the rest of the system how it's behaving because it has the, now the incapacitated condition as well as the frightened condition. And those two things uh, were implied before, and now it's explicit. Okay. The new version of Turn Undead. Hang on. I don't, I don't normally do this. Uh, I've got a strict no phone policy when playing. I try to keep that strict no phone policy with recording unless, you know, I'm recording on my phone. But I just gotta, I, I gotta check something. Okay. I, I had to double check incapacitated, uh, see if maybe they possibly changed the meaning, but no, 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 it just means they can't take any of their actions. Okay, that's not what, <laughs> I don't know, I've always run incapacitated as, you know, you're incapacitated, you're unconscious, you're, you know, you can't do anything, you can't even, like, move, incapacitated doesn't, doesn't stop your movement, it, I don't know, I don't know, um, I've always taken more literal definition on that word, but, it's never really been implied that they were both incapacitated and frightened and turned undead. It, it just, their action was used for the dash. That was, you know, the thing. Like, it, it, in fact, that kind of judging, looking at the, the definition or the, the condition ruling on incapacitated for 5e, they couldn't have been incapacitated and frightened because incapacitated says that they can't use any actions. It doesn't limit their movement, but they can't use any actions, and dash is an action. So, uh, I don't, I don't know. He's kind of giving misinformation here, or he's not misinformation, I guess. He's just crossing wires. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I also didn't think they needed to change the turn undead. I like the changes they made. Don't get me wrong; they're good changes. They're they sound like fun changes. We'll see them, you know, when when the book finally ships out. We'll get to see them in action. I don't think they needed to be changed. No changes needed to be done, um, but it does seem like a fun change, and I'm looking forward to it. I just he's guess he's kind of getting some wires crossed. It's kind of mixed signals, you know. Oh well. Is then buffed later. Uh, at level five by another new feature called Seer Undead. And with this feature, you now have the option when you use Turn Undead uh, to blast the undead creatures that you're turning with radiant energy and oh, deal nice. damage to them. This is a way for you to have your Turn Undead have an offensive capability without requiring the undead to hit a particular challenge rating threshold to be destroyed by your turn undead. So the 2014 version of turn undead, when you got to higher level, would just simply destroy certain undead creatures. And what we found is the problem with that is it was this very kind of all or nothing yeah. thing. Uh, and then that also meant that you gain no benefit against 
creatures that were not within that, that very specific challenge rating range, we replaced that primarily because we wanted to give you a buff that you were happy to have no matter what the CR was of the undead creature. And so now you have this ability to like, you don't have to worry about what the CR is. Once you have it, you have the option of blasting it with radiant damage. And the advantage of this new feature is eventually this radiant damage will get high enough that you will still pretty much automatically destroy very low CR undead. Yeah. So you will often, particularly if you have lucky damage rolls for the radiant damage, still incinerate uh, the undead that you're turning. But even when you don't do that, you're still going to be able to pump out some radiant damage, even against that high CR lich. Yeah, perfect. Makes sense. Now, at level 7 in the Cleric, we also have a new feature called Blessed Strikes. And Blessed Strikes is a replacement for two different features that appeared previously in subclasses. Cleric subclasses in the past tended to have uh, either a feature called Divine Strike or one called Potent Spellcasting. Divine Strike pushed the cleric toward uh, weapon use and potent spellcasting, it's in the name, buffed the, the cleric spellcasting, specifically the cleric's cantrips. And because we now let you at first level decide which of those directions you want to lean in, uh, we wanted you to then following on from that, get to make a choice between Divine Strike and Potent Spellcasting at level seven, rather than automatically giving you one of those as part of a particular subclass. And we found that doing it the old way kind of pigeonholed certain subclasses in ways that wasn't always how the players wanted to play that subclass. You know, we might have decided that a particular subclass got uh, divine Strike rather than Potent Spellcasting, but the player who chose that subclass might decide, but I'm not interested in wearing armor and being in melee. I want to actually hang back and would really have enjoyed having Potent Spellcasting instead. So with that in mind, we've put the power in the player's hands to decide which of those directions that you go in. Yeah, players and NTMs alike were already allowing that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I I think it's weird. Hey, at level one, you get to pick this between, you know, whether you want to be melee cleric or, you know, more spellcasty cleric. Oh, but also at level six, you get to make the same exact decision. Uh, it kind of it kind of makes the, the, the first level feat uh, redundant, not necessary. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this because it, it really is just the same choices as the level one choice you already made. Um, so at, at level one, it's like, hey, do you want to do you want to use your weapon and armor or do you want to use more spells? But don't worry, because in five levels, whatever you didn't pick at level one, you could pick at level six and then you'll have both of them again. I, I'm all for heavy customization on characters. I mean... Even outside of tabletop RPGs, I play nothing but uh, JRPGs, uh, well, RPGs in general. Um, in fact, one of my one of my favorite games outside of tabletop RPGs is is Cyberpunk, and the main reason for that is how heavily you can customize your character in all the different play styles. So it, them giving you more customization is fantastic in my books. You cannot do wrong with me by giving more customization. Um, but when the, the customization you're giving almost halfway through the, the character is the same customization choices that they had at first level, you're not giving customization choices anymore. You're, hey, the, the choice you made at level one is irrelevant because you can now pick the other option at level six. Congratulations, we, <laughs> Gotcha, we were just pulling your leg. You didn't actually have to choose. Ha ha ha. I, I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, the way he described it makes it sound like that. Um, maybe he's just really bad at describing it and it'll look different on paper. Um, but that's the way it, it seems based off of how he described it. So, 
I don't know. I'll try and keep my hopes up. We also, this is a case where we have a note in the feature itself that if you happen to take the new version of the cleric, but wed it to a subclass from an older book, you do not get both the potent spell casting or divine strike from the subclass as well as whatever you choose from the base class. You get, you just get one. Yeah, that was kind uh, of and that, and that's explained I mean, right here that in uh, the cleric itself. It. Okay. Now, when we get to level ten, we have a new version of of divine intervention. Now, previously, divine intervention was a, a style of game design that I sometimes refer to as mother may I yeah. game design, uh, where the, the player basically had to ask the DM's permission for something to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and also this was locked behind a die roll that would determine whether or not your feature even did anything. Yeah. So our goal with the new divine intervention is we wanted to give the cleric certainty that their class feature would actually do something. And so in the new design, uh, you just simply use it and you choose any cleric spell of level five or lower that doesn't require reaction to cast and you cast it. It's that simple. And then you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So what this means is once you reach level 10, you as a cleric, regardless of what cleric spells you have prepared, have in your back pocket the ability to pick any cleric spell a fifth level or lower and decide, I'm casting that now. Uh, so it, it, it still serves the function that divine intervention had before, which is sort of fishing for a divine get out of jail free card. Yeah. And uh, I think yeah, the feedback we got on this was very positive. So that's that's cool. Um, I I think it's great that that divine intervention is no longer locked behind a die roll. I personally would not allow it to be behind a die roll. Um, the way the way I had it run was, um, I would take a look at whatever god or goddess my cleric followed, and I would make a list uh, of uh, like a rough list of things they could do to to gain what I called faith points and. Um, when they used divine intervention, they got to cash in their faith points. They used them like currency uh, to try and get their their god or goddess to to do what they wanted done. Uh, and depending on the scale of the action, it would decide how many faith points it cost. Um, and if they didn't have enough, then I'd let them roll and try and go just go into a deficit, um, and that they'd have to work off before they could even attempt to even talk to their god or goddess um i thought it was really cool it was it, it gave way to a lot of role playing in in my campaigns and my players that played cleric seemed to enjoy it and it was a lot of fun for them this is fun too um it's kind of it's kind of lackluster it doesn't give you as much freedom though my favorite thing about dungeons and dragons is the freedom you can do Pretty much anything as long as you can roll high enough or your imagination's good enough. Um, and Divine Intervention was one of those things that, you know, uh, within reason, if if they followed a god or goddess of life, then they could, and had enough um, faith points, then they could circumvent death to, to varying degrees, right? Uh, fifth level cleric spells are cool, and being able to just cast one at the drop of a hat, you know, once per long rest is, is cool. Don't get me wrong, and I think this is a great change to Divine Intervention, and I think a lot of people are going to love it. And like like you said, I'm sure a lot of people already loved it during the the play test. Um, I think it. I personally think it does kind of limit what what Divine Intervention is capable of on the grander scheme of things, but this is still a fantastic change that makes new players look at we'll look at this and not, not be like oh so i have a chance of this feature doing absolutely nothing now it for sure does something every time no matter what um uh, and that's great that is absolutely fantastic uh and what's also really nice about it is when you cast the spell you don't spend expend a spell slot 
and you do not need material components. Yeah. yeah. So this free spell. Means, yes, yeah, that's great. You could choose raise dead, yeah. which is a fifth level spell, and cast it, calling on divine intervention to raise some run from death. Yeah. And so we design this very specifically to make that happen because what else feels like divine intervention than bringing back somebody from the dead. You are going to ruin the diamond economy in d, &D. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. All the Good. Ruin the diamond economy. Ruin it. I don't like spell components. For some things, they make sense. I don't like spell components. I have... One of my, one of my best handling shorts tells you just how much I hate spell components and if you look at the actual components comparing the spells they're just jokes they're just jokes i don't care good ruin the diamond economy for dungeon dragons ruin it because here's the thing you have no idea what your god or goddess would deem a diamond to be worth just because the shopkeep tells you, oh, this diamond's worth a thousand gold, you take it to another shopkeep, there's no guarantee they're going to tell you the same thing. You don't know if you were lied to. You don't even know if it's real diamond. I mean, uh, barring certain skill checks that you shouldn't have to do. But that's what I'm saying. Like, It doesn't specify you have to spend a thousand gold pieces on this diamond. It doesn't... It, there's no specification that says that it has to be worth a thousand gold pieces. It has to be worth that to who? To who? You know, the the rich nobles, they'll have a giant diamond go, this is worth a thousand gold pieces to me. But some homeless person, you know, the uh, the it's their family heirloom and it's this tiny little, you know, dime-sized diamond. To them, that's worth a thousand gold pieces. So who gets to dictate what it's worth in this in the spellcasting component, right? It's you have to bring this kind of stuff into this game because it's 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 just the way things work no two people are going to agree on the the cost of one diamond especially when it's varying degrees to to somebody who's dying and they're about to die and they know they need that diamond to to bring them back they'll say any diamond is worth a thousand gold pieces because it's their life on the line if you're a cleric and, and the person you love just died, any diamond is priceless to you, worth a thousand gold pieces or more because it's going to bring your loved one back to life. So who gets to dictate how much the diamond is worth? Good. Screw the diamond economy. Screw the spell component economy in general. But especially the diamond economy. Screw it. All right, that's my TED talk. These NPCs that sell diamonds are just to, to all, in, in all of their shops outside all the temples and D and D cities. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Five hundred gold piece worth of diamond. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now at level fourteen, we improve blessed strikes, and so whichever option you chose earlier at level seven, divine strike or potent spell, spell casting, it gets even better. And then finally, at level 20, we have Greater Divine Intervention, uh, which now lets you choose the Wish Spell. And the Wish Spell, uh, as the Divine Intervention that you're reaching out for, uh, and gives you all of the magical flexibility that Wish gives a spellcaster. And the Wish Spell has been expanded in the spell chapter. It has several new built-in options uh, that do not risk you triggering the... Uh, the Monkey's paw. The, yeah, yeah the, <laughs> the... Boring. Boring. I love the wish spell because if your players aren't precise, if they're not wishing for exactly what they want with no room for, for varying interpretation, you can do what you want you can mess with them that's the best part of the wish spell it's the most broken spell in the game you have to have some way of messing with your players whenever they use it you have to you just have to with with as broken as it is because you can do literally anything you can do anything with it um but if they word things wrong you can screw with them Sure, they'll still most likely get whatever it is they're asking for, but they're going to get it in a way that they weren't expecting, you know? 
Uh, I wish for the BBEG to, to die. Well, okay, sure. They'll die. Well, not right now, though. You didn't specify when. Ow. Eh, sucks to suck. You know, that's kind of a... Uh, egregious one sure but it's like that's the best part about it that's the most fun part about it you know you're so and so died i wish and and they're beyond the the scope of any of your resurrection spells i wish for them to be alive again cool uh roll a d12 oh you got a six all right they're alive but now they're a tiefling you didn't specify that they want that you wanted to be back to life in that same body or without their body changing, so they're alive, but they're a tiefling now. You know? It, it's fun stuff like that. This it's that's the best part of the wish spell is messing with your players when they're not precise enough. So having built in spells or built in wishes that have no chance of of that boring. I want my players to think of how they're going to make a wish without giving me the chance to mess with them. They got to earn that. Boring. The fatigue uh, that wish uh, can impose upon a person. Yeah. Uh, and it also has further guidance in the spell of what happens to you if you try to mess with gods uh, or even worse with the Lady of Pain. Yeah. Uh, like our other dedicated spell casting classes, the spell list has been expanded. Uh, not only because of new spells that are in the book, like Summon Celestial, uh, but also because of spells that were already in the game in 2014 that clerics now have access to. Uh, and our cleric subclasses definitely also then get to make use of the bolstered spell selection because of their domain spells. Uh, so shall we dive into the life domain? Yeah, let's get into the life domain. This is kind of the classic cleric. The life domain cleric is meant to be the preeminent healer in the game. Uh, I often like to tell people that if they really love playing a healer uh, and they like the aesthetic of the cleric, the life domain is fantastic. Uh, you really cannot go wrong choosing this uh, if you want to be a character who's all about helping other people. We took the really excellent features in this subclass and we, we fine-tuned them, altering some of the spell selection in the, divine, in the domain spell list so that uh, the life domain cleric would be even more on theme in terms of uh, their healing prowess. Um, and we've even done... Uh, subtle tweaks that people might not notice immediately, like, for instance, Preserve Life um, now actually works on undead and constructs. Oh, fantastic. The fact that a number of healing spells did not work on undead and constructs actually created a number of design headaches for benevolent undead or constructs that might be in a player's group, either because they summoned them or they became <laughs> undead, but are still, you know, heroic. Uh, or there are constructs. Yeah, uh, we, we ran into this with the reborn lineage. Was this, was this a problem? I mean, I'm serious. If this is a problem for you, let me know in the comments. Like, I don't see how this could have ever been a problem. It, 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 it doesn't say that it has to be a living creature in this. In and none of the healing spells say that they have to be living creatures in the the spell description. Um, just says target creature. Target creature you can touch. Target creature you can see. Target creature. Undead or creatures. Cro constructs. I mean, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but constructs are creatures. You know, if you've got a Warforged, that's a construct, but it's an ally. Like, obviously, you can heal them. Um, I personally would say Mend is better for healing constructs. But, it, well, now we're just splitting hairs. But... Yeah, I mean, was that really a problem? Who was that a problem for? Especially when when reborn, uh, you know the the uh background that lets you be an undead is when that came out. 
Yeah, I had plenty of of undeads. I there I had one campaign where where I had an undead warlock, um, and he was healed constantly by the cleric. Like he, he in fact, he didn't even tell anybody that he was undead. He kept his face wrapped up, and you know he he would always have to role play. You know he he'd get his own room so that he never shared a room with anybody. And then every every morning before he went out and met up with the rest of the group. He would put some like smell good on himself so nobody could smell the decay. Like he healed constantly. Like, it's never been a problem. I don't understand why they're saying it's a problem. Like I don't. Oh, we're just now making it so you can heal your undead allies and your construct out. Al we could before. Like I don't. I don't understand why they are saying this or even thinking that. I don't know of a single DM that wouldn't let their players heal their allies just because they were playing an undead or a construct. Um, <laughs> I don't know. If, if you had it, like I said, if you had a DM or you've played in a campaign where you couldn't heal your, your undead ally or your construct ally, let me know. Let's, let's talk about it because that sounds super interesting and, and weird and awkward and I've got to hear the story behind it. So, let me know. Any age at the time. Exactly. Uh, and so, uh, people will notice that not just in Preserve Life, but many places in the player's handbook where before healing, certain healing effects didn't work on undead and constructs, uh, that has largely been removed. And instead, when the monster manual comes out, uh, people will find that certain monsters, particularly, particularly monsters that are made of like shadow stuff from the negative energy plane, it, it, we are exploring it being a feature of the monster themselves. It isn't even that, oh, they, that they can't be healed, it's that they're actually harmed by healing spells. Yeah, 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 that and, makes a lot of sense. And so that, that actually will is allowing us to bring back some flavor that has existed in earlier editions of healers being able to turn their healing spells on certain kind of fell creatures. But for that, people will have to wait for the new monster manual. That's awesome though, that's a great change. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you will also be able to uh, restore life to say your, because again, I know you as the, the, the ever lover of warlocks. Yes. If the warlock has a skeleton yeah. <laughs> in the group, the cleric can now heal uh, their friend's skeleton. I will laugh. <laughs> that is perfect. That brings us to the light domain, another popular subclass for the cleric. The light domain has had uh, quite a bit of revision within it. Part of that was based on us wanting to make it a little less one note and being all about fire, 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 fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's wrong with that? Um, <laughs> partly because the light domain has always been meant to represent sort of divine illumination, yeah. which fire is certainly a fun uh, expression of that, Right. but it's not the fire domain, it's the light <laughs> yeah. domain. Yeah. And so we've preserved some of the you know, tasty, fiery bits. So, you know, don't worry, Fireball is still here. But we wanted to also bring in some spells in the domain list that are about vision, about, uh, and, and I, I mean sort of metaphorically about mm -hmm. vision. And so there's some divination spells here uh, that are about wiping away falsehood, uh, that sort of thing. And so that's why, you know, you'll see things here like scrying and see invisibility, uh, that, that sort of thing, arcane eye, uh, these are here. Uh, we also uh, made it so that the level three warding flare feature is usable right away whether you're the person being targeted or somebody else. Okay. It used to be you had to wait to a higher level mm -hmm. uh, to have the I help my friend version of it. You now get that right away. Then later at level six, when you get improved warding flare, when you use warding flare to protect somebody, you now also can give them temporary hit points 
and oh, wow. you also now regain all uses of warding flare whenever you finish a short or a long rest. Oh, that's fantastic. So the, the light domain cleric is going to be able to use their signature ability warding flare more often, and it's even more potent than it was before. We've also taken a look at Corona of Light, and we've now made it so that it imposes disadvantage on saving throws against your Radiance of the Dawn, in addition to any spells that deal fire or radiant damage. We wanted there to be more internal synergy here because uh, we didn't want it to just benefit your spells, but then you have your channel divinity ver your channel divinity option to just emit a whole bunch of light right. and have it not benefit. So this also Don't is a the theme you and I have returned to in these videos of more synergy, more feeling yeah. like you can combine your abilities with your friends' abilities but also, very importantly, combine your own abilities uh, with each other uh, in, in new ways. And I'm excited to see how people combine things that we haven't even imagined yet. Yeah, that is, I, I'm doing a lot of like coming through this book already and trying to come up with different combinations. That's part of the fun. Now, uh, next up we have- It's already coming through the book looking for combinations. Must be nice. Only 11 content creators got that book. Must be nice. I will always be salty about that. Don't mind me. The Trickery Domain. I love the Trickery Domain. This is one of the best. Uh, I, I love this subclass. I love the theme of it. And this is, I mean, the spell list was always fantastic for the Trickery Domain, but now the functionality of like the Keystone abilities are, fan are really, really good. And the trickery domain, in many ways, is the foil to the light domain. Mm -hmm. Many of the subclass quartets in the book are are often actually um, two duos. Yeah. And in the cleric, the trickery domain, which is all about uh, illusion and sort of pranks, deception, and 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 being the trickster, is. The counter to the you know the light of revelation, yeah. seeing everything as it really is, and then similarly, the life domain cleric has its foil in this class in the form of the war domain cleric. One yeah. one being all about restoring vitality to people, and the other about destroying things. Yeah, uh, and so yeah, the cleric we have these this fun axis going on with these four subclasses. Now, the trickery do domain, as you said, uh, got some really nice updates. And it starts right away in Blessing of the Trickster, which now the cleric can uh, actually use on themselves, uh, which they used to not be able to. And it used to last just for an hour, but now it lasts until uh, the end of your next long rest. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, which is a, a really nice uh, way to ensure that people can use this for maybe extended infiltrations. Yeah. Uh, particularly if the cleric uses it on somebody else and you know it wouldn't be around to, in the past, refresh it yeah. after it wore off uh, after an hour. Oh yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. So Invoke Duplicity, uh, which is the, of course, the the signature ability of this subclass, uh, got improved in a number of ways uh, in both the base feature as well as in the improvements that come later at level 17. One is you can now summon up your illusory duplicate as a bonus action instead of an action. Perfect. And you do not have to concentrate on it anymore. I'm sorry, what? I love the... <laughs> hey. Mm. I love that it's now a bonus action. That just makes sense. The, the fact that it took an entire action before didn't really make sense. But you don't have to concentrate anymore. You're holding the illusion. The illusion isn't like gaining consciousness and doing its own thing and, and keeping itself in the plane. Like, it's, it's an illusion. I don't... Uh, this hurts my brain. Um, 
I know a lot of clerics who are like, it's great that I don't have to concentrate anymore. And sure, it's just, it doesn't make sense to drop the concentration from that, from Invoke Duplicity. It's, you're holding an illusory version of yourself in the plane and actively telling it what to do to try and, you know, confuse the enemy or confuse whoever's around you. It, it I... I just I don't know why why all of a sudden um it, it's you don't have to concentrate on it anymore because you you still have to mentally tell it what to do it, it's not like I said it's not gonna grow consciousness right it's it's it can't think for itself it's not a living thing it doesn't have a thought process it can only do what you tell it to do via mental commands which requires concentrating requires thinking about it I don't. I just I don't understand why they decided to go this route. I guess it it it's gonna make a lot of people happy. Don't get me wrong. It just doesn't make any sense to me personally. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> because <laughs> that was so difficult. Yeah, yeah. The the combination before of it taking your entire action and you having to concentrate on it meant you were in some ways being shut down in two ways. You were you were spending it a whole turn bringing it out, and then you couldn't at the same time have a, you know any of the clerics really nice concentration spells going simultaneously. Yeah. And so we wanted to address that when we revisited this subclass. Yeah, it's it's a huge boon. Invoke duplicity is a huge thing. Like it, it it's helpful it's super helpful it's not more helpful than some of the other concentration spells but it's super helpful it does its job well like it it makes you you have to decide do i want something that's going to confuse the the enemy or the people around me you know do i do i want to use this create an illusion to try and help me like infiltrate this building to to try and steal something to you know, to try and get these creatures away from my allies to attack this illusion while I heal them up real fast because, spoiler alert, the majority of the healing spells are not concentration spells. You can cast them while concentrating on Invoke Duplicity, right? It did its job. It, it Sure, it kept you from using any of your other concentration spells, but the other concentration spells aren't needed while you're using uh, Invoke Duplicity. It... I... I'm just going to go back to my original point of I don't know why they made that decision uh, personally. And, and there's honestly probably no way they can describe it that will make me understand or even agree with this decision because it's an illusion that you're commanding with your with mental commands. You're telling it what to do with your mind, which requires thought process, which requires you to focus, concentrate. I I get where they were coming from. To an extent, you know, oh, invoke duplicity probably isn't seeing much play because you can't use any of your other concentration spells. It still saw plenty of play. It was still a really good spell. It was still a really good, you know, thing to do. Um, even with it taking your, your action and having to concentrate, it was still a solid turn. Um, I think it'll see a lot more play now that it's a bonus action. But they should have kept it as a concentration spell, in my opinion, because it just makes sense. You have to concentrate on it. You have to focus on telling it what to do to get it to do stuff. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there. Like, minor illusions, it's just going to sit there. Um, or you can give my, your minor or major illusion a, a command when you create it in the walkway. And even those, I, I, I think, are concentration spells. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've looked at them. But, like, I don't know. It... I don't know. I don't know. So that the subclass felt like it was playing nice with the rest of the class <laughs> yeah. and not and not shutting your own class down uh, through its use. And again, that is a, a lot of the change in design is what you want to do during a turn happens so much faster. Yes. In the higher level, improved duplicity up at level 17, that used to create multiple duplicates. You now just have one duplicate. Uh, but what we've now done is that 
your duplicate now assists not just you, but also your allies uh, when it comes to conferring advantage. Okay, see, this would have made a lot more sense. If, if they wanted to make it so you only get one duplicate, Invoke Duplicity no longer makes multiple duplicates, um, then at this higher level where it would have originally given you multiple duplicates, now you no longer have to concentrate on it. Now it gains a mind of its own somehow. You're... You know, your divinity is is guiding your your illusion, you know, to assist your entire party instead of just you. You don't have to give it mental commands anymore. Your your divinity is, you know, whatever divine you follow is issuing these commands. You know, it, that would make a lot more sense than as soon as you get invoked duplicity, you already don't have to focus on it. You, you know, it because it, it could have assisted people before if you told it to. You know, it, now it assists people automatically, automatically. Uh, it would make sense if you're getting rid of the amount of duplicates you can make at the higher level, then that's when you no longer have to concentrate on it. Not right out the gates, you know, not, I, I don't know. I don't know, it just doesn't make sense to me. On attack rolls, and when the illusion vanishes, it now heals, you can have it heal somebody next to it. Uh, we wanted, again, this illusion to be more cleric-y uh, so that it truly felt like you're not just a trickster, you are a trickster cleric. And so that's why we brought in more of this element of you being able to assist your team in addition to assisting yourself. There's another really juicy the add-on to this ability. Yes, uh, between level three and 17, there is now a brand new feature. And that is, whenever you take the bonus action to create the illusion, uh, you can teleport, swapping places with the illusion. And this not only gives you some really fun mobility, but it makes it so that the the Trixie cleric can mess with enemies even more because yeah. if suddenly you're swapping positions, they think you're over there, but you're actually over here. Yeah. And then on top of it, we modified the domain spell list, and that's something we did in all of them to try to make the list of spells uh, that uh, you have from this subclass as thematic and as fun as possible. So finally, we have the war domain. Yeah. The war domain has been improved across the board. One of the ways that you'll see that immediately is in Guided Strike. You can now, right from the start, use this to benefit other people. It used to be that you could only use it on yourself when you first got it. And this is the, for people who don't remember, this is the channel divinity where you can just give yourself a gigantic plus 10 to hit. Yeah. Uh, and you know, people have seen Omen Drawn do this many times in Acquisitions Incorporated, but you had to wait till a much higher level to be able to use it on other people. Yeah. Now you can use it on yourself or other people right away. Oh, wow, okay. And we did this um, similar to some of the changes we made in the trickery domain. We did this so that this would be more cleric-y right from the start. Uh, the whole cleric class is about interactions with other party members. Because even if you're a cleric who isn't focusing on healing, clerics still have a number of abilities that otherwise buff their friends. And so we're always looking for ways to make sure that even when clerics might be leaning more in a sort of damage dealing direction, that there still is a, an interaction element when it comes to their buddies. Now the advantage of doing this also means we free up a, a f class feature slot where we can then put in yeah. something new <laughs> uh, so that you're not having an entire feature eaten up by now you can use this on your friends. Yeah. Uh, so there's a double advantage to us uh, making a change like this. We also, in the War Priest ability, uh, which you get at third level along with Guided Strike and your domain spells, uh, we have we have made it so that you can now uh, m make an unarmed strike with 
the bonus action attack, not just uh, a weapon strike. This is actually something we've done in a number of places in the new player's handbook, where previous abilities that only worked with weapons now also work with unarmed strikes. Uh, we're doing this not only for the sake of multi-classing, but also because we know that people, regardless of what class they have, sometimes like the fantasy of playing an unarmed character. Uh, and so we wanted to support that. Translation. We're doing this just because. We don't have any real reason. I, I like it. I do. I like it. Uh, unarmed strikes have been vastly underused. Um... But if you're making a feat work for an unarmed strike as well, that's fine. That's fine. Don't try and judge it up. Don't say, oh, we've got a legitimate reason for it. And our re reason is, uh, uh, um, oh, look, a squirrel. You know, <laughs> I'm not saying that don't let these feats work on unarmed strikes. Please let them work. Because unarmed strikes are, like I said, a uh, vastly underused and untapped market. Um... But don't try and pretend like you're doing it, oh, so that the multi-classing works better. That's not why you're doing it. It wouldn't have any effect on multi-classing. Be real. You're not fooling anybody. I mean, not really. The only people you're fooling are, are the ones that aren't looking into it too deeply. Like... I know it sounds like I'm like shitting on this decision, and I'm really not. I'm I support it wholeheartedly because I love unarmed strikes. Um, because there's always that chance that you know, you're you know, camping out and you don't have a choice, and then you know it get your camp gets attacked, and you don't have a chance to grab your weapon before you start getting attacked. Well, now you have to make unarmed strikes. So it's great that that there's so many feats that affect the unarmed strike now. Um, like the Bard's uh, uh, College of Dance subclass makes it so that you can do so much with unarmed strikes. The Cleric's given stuff for unarmed strikes. It's it's great. It's fantastic. But just be up front with it, you know? Uh, we have uh, also made it so that you regain the uses of your War Priest ability uh, when you complete a short or a long rest. So you're also going to be able to use this more often. At level six, with the War God's Blessing, we reuse the old name, but in terms of functionality, it is brand new because now we've made it so that you can burn channel divinity uses to cast Shield of Faith or Spiritual Weapon. Uh, we decided we wanted to make the War Domain Cleric the type of cleric who has the easiest time that's <laughs> that is a wonderful wonderful thing to be able to do i had a lot of players that didn't know what to do with their channel divinity and i know um just by scrolling through reddit i know i've seen a lot of people who don't know exactly what to do with their channel divinity so now that you can use your uh spectral weapon or your shield of faith while by burning a, a channel divinity charge instead of a spell slot uh <laughs> Now, even the people who don't want to try and figure out what, what exactly to do with their channel divinity can still use their channel divinity in a useful manner. Um, so the, the resource economy is, is going to go up. It's going to be where it needs to be now for clerics. This is a, a fantastic change because of that. Casting two of the most iconic, low-level, yeah. war-themed cleric spells, Shield of Faith and Spiritual Weapon. One defensive and the other one offensive. And so that means that the, the war domain cleric, more than any other cleric, will be able to shield their allies or bring out that spectral weapon to bash foes uh, easier than any other uh, kind of cleric. This is a nasty spell list too. Steel Wind Strike is in here. Oh yeah, the spell list has been revised in ways that are really exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah so the Steel Wind Strike, uh, this is a great example of how all the domain lists and other subclass spell lists have benefited from the expanded spell chapter. Because Steel Wind Strike wasn't in the 2014 Player's Handbook. But when we made the decision to have this really spicy... I gotta pull out the old phone again. Because I'm not well versed in 
all spells. There's hundreds of them. I can't be. You flourish your weapon used in the casting and then vanish to strike like the wind. Choose up to five creatures you can see within range. Make a melee spell attack against each one. On a hit, target takes D 6d10 force damage. Uh, I'm sorry. What? Now, this is a 5th level spell. I don't know if it's still going to be a 5th level spell because according to dnd 5 ewikicom this is a ranger and wizard spell. It's not a cleric spell, but it's in a, the war domain spell list. So I don't know if it's still a 5th level spell. Um, I, I, this is in the Xanthar's Guide to Everything, which is one of the few books I don't have. Um, but if you guys want to buy it for me so I can go over it, be you know, feel free. I'd be appreciative of that. But uh, it's a fifth level spell, and it does massive damage to multiple targets. Um, and it's it's on that spell list. That is so cool. Um, <laughs> I understand now why they're making such a big deal about it being in the War Domain spell list. See Ranger spell appear oh, yeah, in this there is book. Ranger spell. I thought, oh, this is perfect for the War Domain cleric yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, before we move on to their capstone, I should also mention that if the War Cleric uses their channel divinity to cast Shield of Faith or Spiritual Weapon, it doesn't require concentration. Oh, <laughs> uh, nice. I know what you're thinking. Oh, he's going to start ranting about how, how it should still be a concentration spell. Uh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is one of those things that, that like, with, with the invoke duplicity, invoke duplicity uh, at the later level, it's being controlled by the divinity. If you're burning a, a channel divinity charge on one of these spells, it's being powered by your divinity, you know, by whatever god or goddess you follow. Follow so it makes sense you don't have to concentrate on it. They're concentrating for you. That's that's great, and it's a little like little kind of role play lore thing that most people wouldn't notice, but <laughs> I notice anything lore related. I'm gonna notice, best believe. I think that's great. That's a cool little flavor thing that I love it. I absolutely love it. And if you cast it again using your channel divinity rather than a spell slot, so extra spicy yeah yeah uh finally avatar of battle even has been tweaked uh in that before you got resistance to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage but only those damage types when dealt by non-magical weapons we've removed that non-magical weapon part so that now you just simply gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Meaning that this new version of the War Cleric, more than ever before, will be able to you know, be this priest character who is throwing down uh, in, in the middle of battle. When you pre-order the digital... I love how they keep buffing the, the capstone or the, the level 20 feats for every class. Um... Every, you know, <laughs> like they think, oh, this is going to make people want to play just this class for all 20 levels. It's not. It's not. I'm sorry, but it's not. It's cool. The, these capstone features are gimmicky. Um, and they look fun. They sound fun. Um, unfortunately, they're not going to get people to, to want to stay in one class for 20 levels. That is a slog fest, no matter what level system you go with, whether it's experience or or milestone, hitting level 20 is a slog fest. And the best way to make it through it, the most fun way to make it through it is by altering your character with multi-classing. Um, I don't think I've met a single player who has wanted to be the same class for all 20 levels i'm sure there are players out there i'm sure and i know for a fact there are dms out there that won't allow for multi-classing because they can't be bothered to learn how it works um and those dms are wrong i've said it a million times and i'll say it another million times if i have to those dms are wrong 
But I'm sure there are players out there that want to play just one class for all 20 levels, and that's cool. Hey, cool. You know, you that's that's commitment right there. I've watched over a thousand episodes of One Piece, you know, and still going, and then turned around and read. A, I'm on chapter 1113. Uh, like, I'm almost completely caught up on the manga for One Piece. Um, like, that's commitment, but wanting to play the same class for all 20 levels, that is real commitment. Like, I'm married and have watched. I'm I've been married for twelve years and and I've watched all episodes of One Piece and read almost all chapters of One Piece. These people who are playing the same class for twenty levels, I would say, are are have a firmer grasp of commitment than I do because I couldn't do it. Right, um, <laughs> I hit the eighth level and usually it's like, okay, it's time to multi class. Uh, <laughs> so more power to them for real. Um, but that's, that's the upcoming cleric class. There's some things that I, obviously I I mentioned I don't agree with. They're not bad changes, um, but I disagree with them heavily. Um, but overall it seems like it's going to be a fun, fun newish class. Like obviously it's still the same class, but they've done enough that it, it will feel fresh. It'll feel almost new. Um. I'm looking forward to it as always, but but you know what? Ultimately, we'll see what happens when when the player's handbook comes out in September. So I I'm trying to stay positive for all of these classes, and the cleric is one of the easier ones to stay positive about because it does look like they've only made good changes. So we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, if there's a class you want me to go over or a certain uh, feature or spell, anything in general that you want me to go over for Dungeons and Dragons or any tabletop RPG, let me know in the comments below. Uh, if you just want to have a conversation with me, you know, that's what the comments are for. Let's, let's talk that I'm, I would love for you guys to tell me stories about some of your pre prior campaigns, campaigns you're currently going through. Um, and I'm working currently working on a story time video for one of my more interesting campaigns where I was a player. Um, I'm looking forward to having those kinds of conversations with you. Uh, we're almost at 500 subscribers, guys. We're uh, about 130 away, uh, which is fantastic because I, I haven't even been at this for a year yet. So you guys have been fantastic, and I appreciate the support. And uh, I look forward to, to even more support that you guys give me. So... Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, well, let me know. Uh, and we'll see if we can fix that. So, thanks for watching.